All right, it is 6.05, so I'm going to get us started. Um, thanks to everyone who's joined. Really exciting to see so many folks. I'm sure the numbers will keep going up, but I'm gonna um, just get us started. I'm a little disoriented on the, uh, I wanna see the screen, but also see my, my document here. Um, all right, so, uh, oh, before I, eat, before I introduce our speaker, I'm going to just read a couple um, basic Zoom things, boring things. Um, those of you who have been to rounds before will not be surprised, but um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Narrative Medicine Rounds are hosted by the Division of Narrative Medicine in the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. I'm Nellie Herman. I know many of you, but lots of you I don't know. I'm a fiction writer and also the creative director of the program. Um, it's really lovely to be here with you today and with Suleika. Um, the Division of Narrative Medicine fortifies clinical practice by training practitioners to recognize, interpret, and glean insights relevant to patient care and clinician performance from the studies of humanities, the arts, and creative work, helping all those interested in person-centered, respectful healthcare to deepen their self-awareness, clinical attunement, collaborative skills, and creative capacities through rigorous narrative training and practices. Um, before I introduce Saleka, I've I've been introduced, I've been asked to mention just a few basic Zoom ground rules. Um, so we're all Zoom experts at this point. I'm sure you know all of these, but um, please keep your microphone muted during the event just to cut down on background noise. Um, if my dog barks and bothers us, I will have to mute myself as well. Um, I, I'm sure he will. Be forewarned, if there are any disruptions or inappropriate comments that come up into the chat, you may be removed from the event. Um, we're gonna lock the meeting in just a few minutes for security reasons. We, if, you, if you leave the meeting or if your internet you know, goes out and you're, you're dropped off the meeting, you won't be able to join back in because the meeting will be closed. But please know that after the event, um, in a day or two, you will get an email with a link to the recording of the event. So you'll be able to watch it in its entirety at that time. Um, in the unlikely event that we have any kind of Zoom intrusion, we're going to terminate the event right away. So if that happens, don't wonder, like, wait, what just happened? That's what happened. Um, but it won't happen, so don't worry. Um, and you'll get a link. If that happens, you'll get a link in your inbox to a new session. So we, we'll just start in a new session. Um, during the talk, we ask you to keep chat interactions to a minimum. As we get closer to the Q&A part of the event, um, I'll invite you to submit questions into the chat. Um, you can feel free to put questions into the chat during our conversation as well, but just, just know that we may not see them. Um, we won't be monitoring questions while we're talking, so you might want to save it for later. Um, but we will look at the chat and see the questions when we, when we get to the Q&A part. Um, the event is being recorded, um, and as, as mentioned, everyone will get a link to it in a day or two. And at the end of the event, we'll have a link to online bookstores where you can order the book um, and find more information about our speaker and about the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics and the program in narrative medicine. All right, so those are my official talking points. Um, all right, so I, I, it's truly um, my great honor to introduce Suleika Jawad, um, who I'm very honored to call my friend. Um, I'm gonna, I, there's so much I could say to introduce this wonderful person, but I'm gonna keep it, try and keep it very brief and professional. Also, cause I know many of you already know her accomplishments. Um, uh, so like, and I just first met a handful of years ago at a narrative medicine conference, which was hosted by our mutual friend, Lisa Weiner at the Kripalu Center in Western Massachusetts. Oh, he's threatening to bark. Um, at that conference, I was lucky enough to hear her speak and was so impressed by her presence, her articulation and her story. In the years since I've followed her work with interest, patiently awaiting her book, which I knew would be tremendous as it is. For those of you who've already read it, you know that to be true. Um, Suleika is the author of the Emmy winning New York Times column called Life Interrupted and has written reported features, essays, and commentary for the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Vogue, and NPR, among other publications. 
Uh, she's a highly sought after speaker. Her main stage TED Talk was one of the most 10 popular, 10 most popular of 2019, has nearly 4 million views at this point. She's also the creator of the Isolation Journals, which maybe some of you have participated in, which is a community creative project founded during the beginning of the pandemic to help others convert isolation into artistic solitude. Um, over 100,000 people from all over the world joined that initiative. Um, anyway, much more to say, but I'll leave it at that for now. So, so happy to welcome you to Narrative Medicine Rounds, Suleika. Um, Thank you, Nelly, and, and hi to everyone who, who's joining. It's such a treat to get to see everyone's faces. Uh, so thank you for, for coming and thank you for having me. It's our pleasure, really exciting. And I, and I read this book, I, I, wrote, I wrote Suleika an email, but I, I read it, I finished it a couple of weeks ago and I just, I'm just brimming over with thoughts and questions and just so excited that I knew this event was coming where I could have a chance to to have her and, and get to, to ask her things. Um, I think maybe I, I have a question that I that is sort of built around a passage from the book, but I think maybe just to give, since we do have a lot of people here and I'm assuming some of them have not yet read the book, um, maybe it does make sense to have you read this passage so people can get a sense of your voice and, um, oh, I don't know, I mean, yeah, whatever you, however you want to introduce. I mean, I'm just thinking like, wait, is there other other things you should we should say about the book before you begin to read? But um, anyway, we can start with the passage and anything else you want to say, and then I'll ask my question based around this. And you know Perfect. what passage to read. So. Uh, so just to give a little context, um, this passage takes place a couple of months after I received a leukemia diagnosis when I was 22. Um, and when I first entered the hospital, I had all these kind of notions of what I was going to do during what I initially thought was just a summer of sickness, although it, you know, went on for much longer than that. Um, and I remember, you know, packing a suitcase full of all the books I'd always intended to read, but never had thinking somehow that I was going to make the most of this time on bed rest and in isolation in a hospital room. Um, but I never ended up reading any of those books. Um, and over the course of that next year, you know, there, there were so many obvious challenges that came with um, being so sick at such a young age. But I think the biggest one was trying to figure out how I could still participate in the world. Um, and I remember I would you know, hear about these cancer survivors who had gone on to do incredible things, who had run ultra marathons and started research foundations. Um, and they enraged me uh, because I wasn't doing any of those things. I was you know, very probably in, in, in my lowest place all my uh, all the standard chemotherapy treatments failed. I was undergoing a, a clinical trial and kind of shuttling between my childhood bedroom in upstate New York and uh, the hospital in New York City. Uh, and so at some point during that time, uh, a friend came up with the idea of something called a hundred day project. And the concept was really simple. We were each going to do one creative act every day for 100 days. Um, and so for my dad, uh, he ended up writing 101 memories of growing up in Tunisia. Uh, for my mom, who's a painter, she painted a small ceramic tile every day that she assembled into a shield and hung above my bedroom wall and told me uh, had protective powers. And for my 100 day project, I decided to keep the stakes very low. And I returned to the thing I'd always done in difficult passages, which was to journal. Um, and, you know, it didn't matter how much I wrote, it didn't matter if it was any good, um, but I committed to doing it every day. Um, so, okay. With that said, uh, let me dive in. People often respond to the news of tragedy with words fail, but words did not fail me day or the next or thereafter. 
They poured out of me, first cautiously, then exuberantly, my mind awakening as if from a long slumber, thoughts tumbling out faster than my pen could keep up. This was different from any kind of writing I'd done in the past. There was nothing future-looking about it. Each sentence was grounded in the now. I'd always imagined myself as the kind of writer who would help other people tell their stories. But increasingly, I found myself gravitating toward the first person. Illness had turned my gaze inward. As a patient, you are constantly asked to investigate the body, to report on yourself and to rate your findings. How are you feeling? What is your pain on a scale of one to 10? Any new symptoms? Do you feel ready to go home? I understood now why so many writers and artists while in the thick of the illness became memoirists. It provided a sense of control, a way to reshape your circumstances on your own terms, in your own words. That is what literature offers, a language powerful enough to say how it is, Jeanette Winterson wrote. It isn't a hiding place. It is a finding place. There were days, of course, when I was too tired to write much, but keeping a journal rekindled my love of words, and that inspired me to begin reading again. My mother had given me a hardbound copy of the diary of Frida Kahlo, and I pored over it. I was moved when I learned that at an age not much younger than I was when leukemia struck, Kahlo had been a pre-medical student in Mexico City. One day, while riding home from school, her bus collided with a streetcar. She suffered fractures of the clavicle, ribs, spine, elbow, pelvis, and leg. Her right foot was crushed and her left shoulder was dislocated. She was pierced by the streetcar's iron handrail, which entered her left hip and exited through her pelvic floor. The injuries left her bedridden for months. Before the accident, Kahlo had dreamed of becoming a doctor. Afterward, she had to abandon those plans, but all that time stuck convalescing at home pushed her to uncover a new passion. I never thought of painting until 1926 when I was in bed on account of an automobile accident, she said. I was bored as hell and in bed with a plaster cast, so I decided to do something. I stole from my father some oil paints and my mother ordered for me a special easel because I couldn't sit up and I started to paint. Kahlo transformed her confinement into a place incandescent with met metaphor and meaning. Using a small lap easel and a mirror hung overhead in the canopy of her bed so that she could see her reflection, she began painting the self-portraits that would make her one of the most famous artists of all time. But the plaster corset she wore to brace her injured spine, the body itself served as Kahlo's first canvas a canvas she returned to again and again. Throughout her life, she had dozens of corsets, objects of both torture and beauty, imprisonment and inspiration that would define the trajectory of her existence and her career. She adorned each one, covering the plaster with scraps of fabric and images of monkeys, brightly plumed birds, tigers, and streetcars. Sometimes she painted her scars, even her tears. I paint myself because I am so often alone, she said. I am my own muse. I am the subject I know best, the subject I want to know better. Kahlo's surgeries and convalescences, infatuations and heartbreaks lived on in her paintings after she died, and she eventually gained a near mythical status as a patron saint of misfits and sufferers. Could these masterpieces ever have been painted by someone who was well, I wondered? Could they have been created by someone who hadn't been forced to confront the terrible fragility of the human body? I wasn't sure. I was no Frida Kahlo, of course, so it was still difficult for me to imagine how I might creatively engage with my own misfortune. But her story had ignited something inside of me. I began to research the long lineage of bedridden artists and writers who alchemized their suffering into creative grist. Henri Matisse, while recovering from intestinal cancer, had worked on his design of the chapel of the Rosary in Venice by pretending the ceiling of his apartment was a chapel and attaching a paintbrush to a long pole, which allowed him to work from bed. 
Marcel Proust had lived lying down as a result of the severe asthma and depression that had plagued him since childhood and penned his seven volume epic in search of lost time from a narrow brass bed in his bedroom, which was lined with cork to buffer him from the sounds of the outside world. Roald Dahl believed his chronic pain had been the creative springboard for his career as a writer. I doubt I would have written a line or would have had the ability to write a line unless some minor tragedy had sort of twisted my mind out of the normal rut, he wrote in a letter to a friend. In all of these cases, it was the very fact of being physically limited, of life being foreclosed in other ways that seemed to heighten imagination and embolden productivity. As Kahlo wrote, Feet, what do I need you for when I have wings to fly? I decided to reimagine my survival as a creative act. If the chemo sores in my mouth made it too painful to talk, I would find new ways to communicate. As long as I was stuck in bed, my imagination would become the vessel that allowed me to travel beyond the confines of my room. If my body had grown so depleted that I now had only three functional hours each day, I would clarify my priorities and make the most of how I spent the time. And with this in mind, I reorganized my bedroom so that everything I needed was within arm's reach. A small night table littered with pens, notebooks, and paper a bookshelf filled with my favorite novels and volumes of poetry, a wooden board that I placed atop my knees as a desk. I wrote when I was home and I wrote each day that I found myself back in the hospital. I wrote until the anger and envy and pain bled dry, until I could no longer hear the persistent beeping of monitors, the hiss of respirators, the alarms that constantly went off. I had no way of predicting all the places the 100 day project would take me, but what I knew for now was that I was starting to find my power. Thank you. I'm re I realized as you were reading that pretty much all my questions really do come back to that passage in a lot of ways. So I'm really glad that we got to hear you read it. Um, so first, and these are like big, broad, they're not like a very, you know, they're big questions. Um, the, so this book, as much as it's a story of your illness journey, it also is a story of how you created meaning for yourself throughout that journey. And also then how you began to re restore, reinvent, rethink yourself and your meaning making um, after the, the crisis of the illness had receded. I was reminded a lot while I was reading it of um, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, um, where he writes, for those of you who haven't read that book, he writes about his experience in Nazi concentration camps and through that, his emergent theory that the primary motivating force for human beings is the search for meaning. Um, he writes, there is nothing in the world, I venture to say, that would so effectively help one to survive even the worst conditions as the knowledge that there is meaning in one's life. Um, I just wondered if you might talk about that a little bit. Um, and also, you know, you, in what you were talking about and in the passage you read, you talk about the 100 Days Project, but really there's so much more in this book, so many more um, uh, evidences, that's not the right word, but um, of you making that meaning, like you, you make your blog and your blog turns into the column that you wrote. Um, so I just, there's so many moments in the book where mm -hmm. you create something um, and it keeps you going and it keeps you, anyway, I'm telling your own story now. Um, so whatever comes to mind in that, and if, if you want to tell the story of how the column came about, I think sure that would be interesting too, but. Yeah, so, you know, um, that title of the book Between Two Kingdoms is a reference to the brilliant Susan Sontag who described how we all have dual citizenship in the kingdom of the sick and in the kingdom of the well, and that it's only a matter of time until they use that other passport. Um, and for me, when I first got my diagnosis, I thought that my time in the kingdom of the sick was going to be a short, sojourn, one in which hopefully I wouldn't have to unpack my bags. And I was determined to remain the person I'd been. I 
resisted the label of cancer patient. Um, but of course, I very quickly discovered that that wasn't going to be possible, at least not for me. Um, I had an aggressive form of leukemia um, and I knew I would eventually need a bone marrow transplant in order to have a shot at a cure. And um, in the end, I ended up spending about four years in treatment, uh, really the better half of my 20s. Um, and that that search for meaning, uh, I think, was tied to a search for identity. Mm. Um, I, you know, from the first day that I was admitted to the hospital that first summer, um, I was given a medical ID number. My name had even inadvertently been misspelled on the door tag outside of my room. Um, and I remember when I woke up from surgery, I had gotten a port implanted in my chest, I looked down and it was really the first kind of physical manifestation of my illness and its treatment. Um, and in that moment, I understood that um, uh, there had been a bifurcation. There was my life before and everything that was going to come after. And the person that I'd been, the aspirations that I'd had, my plans for what, you know, my 20s were going to look like uh, had all been buried. Um, and so, you know, I think more difficult than the diagnosis, than the kind of harrowing treatments, the physical side effects, more difficult even than the possibility of death itself uh, was the idea that I had spent my entire life preparing in essence uh, for a life. I'd gone to college, I'd studied languages, I'd you know, done all this with the hope of someday you know, being an independent adult and, and having the career that I wanted, uh, which was to become a foreign correspondent. Um, and I think the real struggle for me uh, came with this sort of um, hero's journey that's projected often onto patients. Patients are told they're brave, they're told they're inspiring, they're told they're strong. Um, and that as well intentioned as it may have been, didn't resonate with me because I hadn't chosen this disease and I was doing what I suspect most would do in my circumstance, which was you know, focusing on ongoingness and survival. Um, and I really felt this strong impulse uh, especially if my my transplant didn't work to have contributed something, however small, to have given more than I took. Um, and so I returned to writing. Um, and of course I couldn't, you know, travel or interview people or, or be a journalist in, in the sense that maybe I, I dreamed about uh, a year earlier at graduation. But I began to think about how I might report on the front lines of my hospital bed. Um, and I was specifically interested in the young adult patient experience um, because, you know, being in your 20s and being sick is its own kind of in between liminal space. You're no longer a kid, you're too old for pediatrics, um, but you're often, you know, decades younger than some of the other patients. I didn't have a family of my own. I didn't have a career to return to. I didn't really have a fully formed sense of identity to return to. Um, and so it started with the 100 Day Project. And then I, like the good millennial that I am, uh, decided to start a blog. Um, and eventually uh, it was picked up by the New York Times. Um, and you know, my hope uh, with the column that I wrote called Life Interrupted, um, was to really write toward the uncertainty. I think a lot of illness narratives are written from the perspective of someone who survived, who's many years out from treatment. Uh, but it's such a different experience to be in the trenches of treatment, to not know how your story is going to end. Uh, and I really wanted to give ink uh, to, to what it feels like uh, when mortality hangs in the balance and, and how it now only impacts a patient, but it impacts often an entire family or a community. Um, of course, it wasn't the subject I, I would have chosen, um, 
But I think too, that it gave me a, a sense of, of narrative control at a time when I had to cede so much control uh, to my medical team, to others. Uh, and it gave me uh, a, a way to kind of make sense of this illness um, and the imprints it had left in my life. You, you uh, have so many questions, and but your answer has now made me think I should skip over some of the ones I was going to ask and ask this one instead, um, because it's about that that bifurcation idea of the before and the after, um, the difficulty of unifying a self in the wake of a destructive event. Um, at the toward the end of the book, you write. Um, my entire existence, my identity, even my career became linked to the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Um, it, it struck me that there might be people here with us that also wonder about how do you, and if you have thoughts on in your own experience or advice for other people about, because one of the things, sorry, I'm interrupting myself, but one of the things I admire so much about you and, and your career, at least how it seems from the outside, is that it seems as if you've really found a way to unify what you went through, bring it into your life, make it part of your work, but also stay true to what, who, you know, who you were, who you were before, what you always wanted to do, which was this journalism. Um, so how do you, how do you, what, what would your advice be about moving through, moving through that and becoming a sort of more unified self on the other side, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, after four years in treatment, I finally had my port removed. And I remember the surgeon kind of cracking a slightly problematic joke, but he said, congratulations on your deportation. Um, and in a sense, I do think I had this notion that once I had kind of reached uh, a cure and once I was cancer free, I would kind of eagerly and, and quickly and organically fold back into the kingdom of the well. Uh, but that didn't happen. On paper, I was better, but off paper, I was really carrying the wreckage of those medical treatments in my body. I was um, struggling with, with so many things. I uh, was trying to figure out who I was because I couldn't return to the person I'd been pre-diagnosis, but of course I was no longer a cancer patient. And I was really uh, kind of raw in grief um, over, you know, losing that sense of self, losing fellow cancer patients who I befriended during my time in treatment, losing a relationship. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the biggest realization for me was that, you know, we talk about moving on from the traumatic experiences of our past and I came to the understanding or maybe to the belief that moving on is a myth. We don't get to compartmentalize um, and pack away the most painful parts of our past. Instead, we have to move forward with them. And that really requires an act of integration. Um, you know, I describe survival as its own kind of creative act, but I think that process of, of reentry and of recovery and, and survivorship um, and, and the kind of integration work that needs to be done um, is its own creative act. Um, but unlike when I was in treatment, I didn't have treatment protocols. I didn't have a, a medical team kind of guiding my way forward. Um, so I really began to think about uh, rituals and, and rites of passage, these kind of ceremonies that help us shoulder complicated feelings and, and that allow us to bridge the distance between no longer and not yet. We have you know, funerals and weddings and bar mitzvahs, um, but there really is no rite of passage for someone who's emerging from a long or, or traumatic uh, medical experience. And so I had to invent my own. Hmm. What a, what a great cohesive answer uh, to a not very cohesive question. Um, all right, I have two, I'm thinking I'll just ask two more questions and then we'll, we'll get to audience questions. So those of you who do have questions, you can begin to put them in the chat. We'll, we'll attempt to, to read them all when we get there. Um, 
So first, um, just to have you talk a little, because I, I, I want to touch on a little bit of your other work as well, because I know so many folks here will be interested to learn about it. Um, so just, I, I think another huge theme of this book, as we can already tell from hearing you talk, is about is creativity um, and, and translating what we go through into creative works in one way or another. And then of course, also the idea of living creatively, living a life that is you know, fluid and creative of, in one way or another. Um, and uh, well, I, I'll skip, I have a whole written thing, but I'm gonna skip it. Um, so I'm just curious if you would talk a little bit about that. Um, as a theme in the book and also in your life, but also the, the, to touch on um, it, the isolation journals, which to me is, you know, an obvious other extension of, of that and the invitation to bring others into the work of creativity and, 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 and use it in their world, which is, you know, that's where I think you and I, you and I connect, because that's so much of what I think about too. Um, so anything you want to say about that? You know, I think for me, the, the role of, of art and of creativity is reverberation and connection uh, for for anyone here who is a you know a reader and a lover of books. Um, I imagine you've also had that experience of of reading something and and feeling a glimpse of recognition or even a sense of oh I didn't know you were allowed to say that. Um, and um, I think that when we kind of dare to tell unvarnished stories, either our own or, or others, when we kind of dare to be vulnerable on the page, uh, there's a way in which, especially uh, in memoir, the I very quickly becomes a you and then a we. Um, and that kind of vulnerability and reverberation begets vulnerability and reverberation. Um, and, um, you know, when I talked about inventing my own rite of passage, uh, what that looked like for me was first learning how to drive, very important first step, and ultimately uh, embarking on a 15,000 mile solo road trip around the country to visit some of the strangers who'd been writing me letters in response to the column and who were enduring their own aftermath. Um, and, you know, I just, uh, for those of you who've read the book, I, I write about um, a prisoner on death row by the name of Little GQ, who read a column um, of mine where I described what I called my incanceration uh, and wrote me this beautiful letter kind of reflecting on the, parallels between our experiences of facing mortality and also isolation. Um, and so I think um, that that sense of kind of unexpected connection uh, is most powerful to me in, 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 in creativity. Um, and it's the thing I'm, I'm always reading for, I'm always reaching toward in my own writing. Um, and uh, as for the isolation journals, you know, it was a project that was started at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I initially conceived of it as a hundred day project, although now it's still going on. Um, but I kept, you know, returning to journaling, uh, to this idea of journaling, which I think for me, in some ways, is um, the most kind of creatively generative and fruitful terrain, because it's so low stakes, you don't have to be an artist or a writer, anybody can journal and it's in the privacy of your own notebook. Um, and there's a way in which you can write in your most unedited voice and show up as your most unedited self. Um, and so I ended up reaching out to all kinds of people, to authors and artists. I asked little GQ, the prisoner on death row to write uh, a journaling prompt. And I invited um, my community to journal along with me. Um, and it's been really extraordinary to see the kind of connections that have emerged and the friendships um, and, and to know that even across great distances, writing and, and art allows us 
um, to kind of reach through our individual computer screens. I just tried to reach through my screen. I won't do that again. Um, and, and to really um, connect in a way that we might not be able to otherwise. Absolutely. I mean, hurrah, that's, uh, that's narrative medicine right there. Um, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask, I'm going to, I think I was going to ask, I was curious to hear you talk a little, because I know you've been doing um, some activism work around Lil GQ and, and the death row, his death row situation in general. So I was going to ask you about that. But now that I'm seeing all the questions come in, and it's 640, Maybe I maybe we should take some questions from the audience so that I'm not the only one asking questions. Um, so um, there's so many good questions already, and just just a word of warning: there's no way we're going to get to all of these um, with so little time. But thank you for those of you who are putting these questions into the chat. I'll just start with the one right here at the top. Um, this is from Michelle. I'm going to read them rather than ask you to unmute yourselves, just in the interest of time. So forgive me if I butcher your names. I do not do it on purpose. Um, this is from Michelle Nayer. Um, she says, um, I'm a pediatric oncologist turned integrative medicine physician. I sobbed reading your book because it brought up so much emotion and resonated so much about the patients I've taken care of over the years. So much I'd love to talk to you about, but any advice for doctors like me taking care of young adults, either with or recovering from a chronic illness? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. And just from reading um, your, your beautiful, thoughtful question, uh, I don't think you need my advice <laughs> because you're here and, and you're asking this question. Um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, my first summer inpatient at Mount Sinai Hospital. I had uh, this extraordinary doctor, the late great Dr. Holland, um, and he was in his late 80s. And almost every day of those first six weeks I spent in the hospital, he would come and see me during his lunch break and he would sit next to my bedside and he wouldn't talk to me about my latest biopsy results or, or blood tests. He would just ask me questions. He'd ask me what I'd majored in in college, what my favorite books were. He'd ask me what I wanted to do uh, in my life and my career. Um, and he was really uh, taking the time to get to know me as a person first and a patient second. Um, and he was also, you know, pushing me to imagine a life beyond illness. Um, I think there's a way in which thinking about the future can feel really scary uh, when you don't know if you're going to exist in that future. Um, and that kind of daydreaming can feel not only daring, but even dangerous because it requires hope. Um, but I think that's my biggest piece of advice. Get to know your patients, get to know their caregivers. Um, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I haven't brought something up about a symptom I was having or, or some other struggle that I later, you know, understood that I should have because I wasn't comfortable. Um, and I think you can't underestimate both the overwhelm factor, but the intimidation factor for patients and their caregivers when they're talking to their medical teams. Uh, there's the sense that you only have a couple of minutes and that you wanna be respectful of their time. And of course, there are lots of other patients, but I think forming that connection doesn't just make you, you know, a better doctor on a human level, um, but it actually, I think builds a kind of trust that's necessary for, for patients and caregivers um, to bring to their medical team's attention, you know, critical concerns or, or issues. Um, and the second thing I'll just quickly add is to emphasize that, um, you know, focusing on, on your emotional well being um, is, I think, equally important as it is to remembering, you know, to take your medications or whatever it might be. Um, and that's something I wish I'd understood earlier, the psychological toll that illness was going to take on me, on my parents, um, and, and really kind of preparing ourselves for that or, or seeking out different resources. It makes me think about your, the, the part in the book where you talk about how 
early on, um, you know, you, you learned that this treatment was going to cost you your fertility, but no one t told you about that until, and it, you know, this idea of like getting to know the patient sufficiently so that you can understand that that might be something they want to know. Um, so yeah. And, you know, we talk a lot about patient centered care and the one thing, you know, I've, I've come to, to know through my own experience, but also through the stories of other patients is that words like risk and cost are, are you know, profoundly personal terms that mean really different things. So in the infertility example, that was something that felt hugely important to me. And it felt like, you know, the omission of that um, felt like a breach of trust early on in the you know, kind of in that patient doctor relationship, um, mm -hmm. because of course at 22, I hadn't really thought about becoming a mother. If anything, I was, you know, the most thought I'd given was how not to become one before I was ready. Um, but I imagine that conversation would have looked uh, very different with a, you know, a 45 year old patient or a 75 year old patient or a patient who already had children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question is one actually that I wanted to ask as well. So this is convenient. Um, uh, Elsa Ka Kalfin, sorry if I had said that wrong, asks, I'm curious to hear more about your creative process in writing about an experience that was ongoing, that didn't have a definitive end. How did you find the shape of your story as it was inside of your ongoing life? So I, and I was going to ask something similar in the sense that you know, you write about all the writing that you did at the time when you were going through this. And so I'm curious about how the book, how the process of writing the book spoke back to that old writing. Did you use it as you were writing the new writing? You know, how did, what did the process look like? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd initially conceived of the book as a narrative that would just be about the aftermath of illness. And I quickly understood that in order to talk about the challenges of survivorship, of reentry, of that process of moving forward, I needed to explain what had been lost and, and what was at stake. Um, but, um, you know, the journal or my journals were my kind of primary source material. My mom actually very generously even gave me her journals from that period of illness so that I could kind of get some insight into what it was like to sit in the caregiver's chair. Um, uh, but as far as the overall structure of the book, you know, I think um, even though, of course, you know, one of the themes of this book is that you never fully move on from illness. There is an ongoingness to it, even if you're, you're, you're lucky to be healthy. Um, the, the kind of road trip provided a sort of narrative container to fit that in. Um, but um, what I did before I even, you know, started to think about structure was I started with just 20 memories, 20 scenes. Um, and I wrote them without thinking um, and, and without, you know, uh, writing the, the kind of stories I was used to reciting, but just writing 20 scenes stream of cons consciousness. And it was really interesting what emerged from that process. Um, and it became the kind of scaffolding for my book. Um, and then I kind of figured out, well, building blocks needed and to exist between those scenes. Mm. Um, but the last thing I'll just say is um, that while I was working on the book, I had a post-it note above my desk um, that said, if you want to write a good book, write what you don't want others to know about you. If you want to write a great book, write what you don't want to know about yourself. Um, and the reason I wrote that was because I really, you know, wanted to kind of push myself to excavate the truth behind the truth behind the truth. Um, but I also really wanted to um, kind of move away from that um, almost kind of beatific saint-like portrayal that we often have of people who are sick and to write about 
the ugliness of illness, the way it can fracture relationships, the way it can bring us down to our most savage primal self. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, all right, the next one is um, from Michelle Luckenbaugh. So Laika, during your most darkest days of your illness, what or who did you draw strength from? Mm, that's such a good question. I mean, so I think journaling and, and then writing certainly gave me strength, um, but it was really the you know stories of other people who were living their own kind of life interruptions. Um, those correspondences that I was able to cultivate um, with these different pen pals around the world, uh, especially at a time when, you know, I couldn't really, you know, go to public places. I couldn't hang out with friends. Um, and that sense of, of connection and, and for me, you know, staying anchored in the awareness that as much as this experience of illness felt like a kind of terrible privacy, you know, that experience of, of suffering is shared um and 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 kind of reorienting my gaze outward um and, and learning about other stories uh and and making connections with other people who had lived some version or degree of what i was living uh gave me a lot of strength mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit because I think you've you've kind of touched on a bunch of these questions. Um, so here's here's a different one. Um, um, how this is from Kelly Matula. How do you balance your creative pursuits and other work with physical or medical medical limitations? And how open are you about this with other people you work or create with? How has this evolved over the years as your medical needs have changed as you have gotten further out from treatment? Mm, thank you, Kelly. Uh, this is such a good question. It's my eternal question that I'm always trying to answer. Um, so since my bone marrow transplant, I've, you know, I have that still a very compromised immune system. That means, you know, I'm often sick or, you know, over the last couple of years have been hospitalized for infections and complications. I also struggle a lot with my energy level. Um, and so I wish I were in my actual office. I'm in a friend's office. Uh, otherwise, I would show you. I have a reclining chair that I work out of that reclines almost entirely flat into a bed. And so I do most of my work still lying down. Um, and I work in spurts, sometimes in 10 or 15 minute installments throughout the day still. Um, and you know, uh, for anyone who hasn't yet, I recommend uh, reading about uh, the spoon theory. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, Nelly, but it's a great essay about what it's like to live with chronic illness. Um, and uh, uh, I'll drop a, a link to it at the end of the conversation. Um, but basically the idea is that you have a certain number of spoons and everything you do, you use one spoon. And if you're out of spoons at the end of the day, you can borrow against the next days, but you're going to end up paying for that too. And so that has been a kind of helpful concept uh, for me in terms of figuring out how to ration out my energy. I will say uh, that I'm not good at it. I'm always pushing myself too hard and then paying the price for it later. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much a work in progress. Um, and then just, I want to answer your second question, which is how open are you about this with other people? You know, um, I think for a long time after I finished treatment, I felt like I should be more well than I was. And so I was always fronting as well. Um, and, you know, I would, someone gave me a deadline that I knew was going to be a real physical struggle for me. I wouldn't say anything. I would, you know, push myself and then inevitably get sick afterward. And now uh, in the last year, I, I'm trying to be more open about some of those medical and, and physical limitations um, and 
which you know requires sometimes an uncomfortable amount of vulnerability, uh, especially if it's for the colleague. Um, but I find that in a way, when I'm more open, I end up actually being more productive because I can take the time that I need. I can meet the deadlines that I set. Um, and I can really kind of organize my schedule in a way that best syncs up with those limitations. Mm -hmm. um, a, another, a, a similar question about vulnerability here. Um, Jared Alekman says, I'm a liver recipient who documented with my wife the entire uncertain transplant, transplantation journey in photographs. The photographs have become a visual diary for many others, as well as for us. Did you feel vulnerable when first getting wide recognition and how did you overcome it? Mm, it's a good question. I mean, you know, I spent that first year of treatment in complete hiding. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to my diagnosis, I'd been living in Paris where I was working as a paralegal and my Facebook profile still said I was living in Paris for that whole first year. And people would post on my Facebook wall asking if they could crash on my couch. And I just didn't know how to share what had happened to me. Uh, what do you do? Do you post it as a status update? Do you change your profile picture to reveal your newly bald head? I didn't know how, how to navigate any of that. And it felt overwhelming. Um, by the time that I began sharing publicly um, and, and writing about it publicly, I was um, was leading up to my bone marrow transplant and I was never able to get into full remission prior to my transplant. And because of that, I knew that my odds of, of long-term survival, as my doctors kind of put it to me, were about 35%. And I think something about having that actual number and knowing that the odds were stacked against me uh, was really liberating. I stopped really caring. Um, and I think the, the kind of benefit of writing and sharing outweighed any of the concerns I had about um, feeling too vulnerable. But I think the deeper truth is that because I was so isolated, I was writing these things, you know, from my room in the transplant unit um, and kind of filing them and, and sending them out into the universe. And there was a way in which it didn't fully feel real, maybe because I couldn't think about the future. Mm -hmm. So you sort of protected yourself by not protecting yourself, not thinking about it. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's so interesting. Um, all right, we're getting almost to, to seven. So I'm gonna, maybe we can do one or two more. Um, thank you for these wonderful, wonderful questions. There's so many good ones. Um, here's another one. This one is from Manisha Baradia. She says, um, I'm a third year medical student in Canada. Um, your book was such a pleasure to read. Frida Kahlo is one of my role models. When you referenced her diary, I picked it up to better understand some of her, your references and learn more about her story. I want to incorporate writing and art into my future practice as a way to help patients cope and find, refine their place and identity. Is there any advice you would offer of how to do this? Mm, it's such a good question. Um, Sloan Kettering, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center has a really wonderful program called Visible Inc. where they pair patients um, with uh, writing teachers and mentors and everyone gets the opportunity to write an essay. Um, and I think that's such a beautiful way of, of encouraging patients to begin to creatively engage um, with their illness. Um, and the other thing I would say is kind of emphasizing that you don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be someone who is a good writer or a good painter. Um, in fact, I think there's value, I, I call it creative cross-training and, and moving outside of whatever your preferred medium is and, and, and trying something else. It's, you know, I've been playing with watercolors all year. There's a reason why I don't share or post my watercolors because they're not any good. Um, but there's something I think really freeing um, 
when we specifically choose uh, a, a genre or a medium that we're not good at, um, where the goal is purely experimentation and expression and, and a kind of playfulness. Um, so those are the two things I would suggest. Um, starting some kind of writing group um, and um, making it clear that you don't have to be good um, or don't have to have prior experience in order to get great benefit um, from, from writing or, or, yeah, engaging with any kind of artful expression. Yeah, certainly. We, I think we all agree on that one. Um, okay, there's actually two questions right next to each other that are both about metaphor. So I'm gonna ask these, I'll ask them both to you as a, as a double last question. Um, so the first one is Sana Barkatu asks, uh, I wanna ask which metaphor can approximately summarize your illness experience? That's an interesting question. Mm. And, and then right below that, Craig Blinderman asks, a little more complicated, but, um, or maybe not. Did adopting Sontag's metaphor of the two kingdoms and your discovery that it is hard to go back into the kingdom of the well cause you to reevaluate this metaphor as a means of making sense of the experience of being ill? I'm trying to help some of my patients find metaphors who are struggling after curative type treatments, in particular young black patients with sickle cell disease following definitive therapy stem cell transplants. Mm, both such excellent questions. Um, I'll answer Craig's as a way to answer Sana's. Um, I think uh, I, you know, I, I struggled with Sontag's metaphor of the two kingdoms because that kind of binary of, you know, sick well uh, didn't sync up with my lived experience of survivorship. I was neither acutely sick, nor was I well, uh, or, or did I feel well? And so, um, you know, when I think about that in between place, uh, the kind of image or, or metaphor, I guess, that comes to mind is a sort of wilderness of survivorship that exists between the two. Um, and I think the truth is, you know, that that border between the, those two kingdoms is porous and that most of us, you know, depending on the season of life that we're in, or even depending on the day, uh, don't feel either well or unwell. And, and that most of us, you know, end up spending much of our lives somewhere between the two realms. Um, but I'm also a big advocate for people, um, for encouraging patients to come up with their own metaphors um, you know, Sontag talks a lot about the battle metaphors uh, that are used, especially with cancer patients, the idea of fighting your cancer, of, of losing your battle to cancer, which is the one that I've always struggled with the most, um, because of course the people who die of cancer haven't lost a battle. Um, but I think, yeah, in, encouraging patients to, to think about the language that they're using, think about the language they're being met with. Um, you know, if I had a penny for every time someone told me that, you know, um, to stay positive or to search for the silver lining or that God doesn't give us more than we could handle, then I would be a very, very rich woman today. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, all of, all, all of that is, is is useful and and also kind of creatively fascinating to me. What what language we gravitate toward, what language uh, repels us or even enrages us, and what language we can create. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for your tremendous eloquence on all of these things and for being so open. I was like, should, is it okay to ask? Some of these questions are very vulnerable making. So thank you for just being open and honest about everything. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today and for your work, all of your work, this tremendous book. Um, yeah, you guys, if you haven't read it, you should. Um, there, We're going to put up a slide with links to, to where you can buy it. Um, we always recommend not Amazon, but 
anywhere else you want to buy it is great. Um, and uh, as I said before, you will receive a link to the recording in a couple days. Um, what else am I supposed to tell you? Come back to rounds next month. We have really fun. Uh, we're going to be joined by Freestyle Love Supreme uh, Academy. And they're going to tell us and teach us about improvisation and beatboxing, which will be fun, I'm sure. Um, and yeah, that's it, I think. Um, thanks so much again, Suleika. And thank Nelly, you. Nelly, thank me. you. And if I may, um, if you haven't read Nelly's novels yet, you should. Um, oh, thank you. You're nice. And, and thank you to everyone who, who joined us and who asked such thoughtful, brilliant questions. Thank you for being with us. And we look forward to more your continued involvement in our work and our program and many other things in the future.